to another episode of the O'Shea Vlogcast. I am your host, O'Shea Duke Jackson. And today I have an esteemed guest, uh, brother who is a subscriber and also has just written uh, at least two articles that are visible now on the negromanosphere.com. One article he wrote uh, was a stunner, The Emasculation of Black Men in Hollywood, which is our title today. But I have Ron Armstrong, filmmaker. He uh, is a playwright, excellent writer uh, in his own right. Welcome to the show, man. Glad to have you. Thank you, O'Shea. Thank you. I appreciate you inviting me here. I've been a fan of your show for a long time. All right. So I'm glad you're here, man. You're very, very talented, uh, super talented, brother. I remember I saw you in the, in the in subscribers there and saw your name. Um, and man, wow, you, you, you wrote, you're one hell of a writer. Uh, for those of you who don't know, we must uh, talk about that. But not only that, you have a, a lot of experience, in particular um, in Hollywood. Let's talk about your experience in Hollywood, uh, what you do uh, for, the, for the audience out there. Yeah, I originally, you know, I had a long history with the high school and college for filmmaking. Uh, I got out of that and I started to see where um, film was going, which was the streaming and online experience. So I started a, a web company and started learning web development and streaming video and all that. And at that time, everything was on VHS. So I saw that the studios, the major studios like Paramount Pictures and 20th Century Fox were putting their libraries, um, you know, online uh, for streaming. And I said, well, this is the way to go. So, you know, I started my web company and I got crushed by the big studios. And so I decided to do consulting. So I started working for Paramount and, you know, and, uh, Columbia and all those studios as a consultant and I would build their websites I would shoot their online content and you know along with that I kind of like split my time so I would do my own personal projects where I would shoot my films I would put them online I would go to the festival circuit I would travel and um, you know when I was coming up I was working with people like um, Spike Lee the Hudlin brothers I knew these guys I worked with them on their productions in fact, in high school, I was uh, working with Spike Lee and his brother Sankey Lee on his first film, Best Eye Barbershop. Um, so, you know, I have a lot of experience, too, in startups. and I've worked a lot of startup companies. And um, one of the first startups companies we did was one called Real Act, which allowed actors to put their um, online profiles, make videos, and put them online for casting directors to see. So, you know, I've worked a lot in that area. But now I'm really specifically um, focusing on film production and also helping filmmakers get into the business. But more importantly, uh, kind of understanding what the business is about because there are a lot of myths and misconceptions about you know, Hollywood and, and what and, and how open it is to people of color. Let's let's talk about that last part, because um, the Hollywood part in the people of color, it, let's be specific here. Uh, you know, we're talking about black people. And if we want to narrow that down, black men, in which you wrote a, a wonderful article on that. Um, how hard is it for, you know, people of color, black men in particular, black men specifically, to get into Hollywood and the kind of roles they can get? Okay, so um, let's talk about it in terms of filming as, as a director, if you're going to be a director, a screenwriter, or an actor. Um, it, it, you know, what, there's a good book that everybody should uh, read. It's by Mark, Michael Malcolm Gladwell called The Outliers. And what this talks about is we think as black men that we have this perception, right, that we can just get into a business, you know, and there's a free market. It's all about capitalism. We can dominate the business and we can get a percentage of the profits, but it doesn't work that way because let me tell you something. Um, let's say you're competing against Amazon.com. You're gonna create your own, say, black Amazon. Do you think Amazon's gonna sit there and allow you <laughs> to get a piece of their pie? No, they're gonna, it, this is business. They, they're gonna try and crush you. So when you go into a Hollywood, you have to think about it. Hollywood was um, created um, as a, as, as a, it's, it was, in, 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 in other words, let me recommend this book as well, because I, I, I read a lot of books. It's called An Empire of Their Own. It talks about how Jewish immigrants started Hollywood, started the studios, you know? Uh, so you're going into somebody else's kind of like their, their patriarchy, their business. And if you're thinking you're going to go in there and you're going to be welcomed with open arms, you got another thing coming, all right? So that's something you have to be very, very mindful of, that you're a visitor, you're a guest. You know, so there is some some leeway or latitude that you're given. But for many of us, we think that we can go in there and that we can get to the same level as a Brad Pitt or we can get to the same level as a Steven Spielberg. 
You know what I mean? And that's just not the case. And now what we're seeing now is what's going on in Hollywood is there, there are these hidden agendas. And that if you are playing by those agendas, then Hollywood will put you in certain positions of power. And I, I only point to people like Lee Daniels, Tyler Perry, who are very talented, but there are specific reasons why they got to the positions that they are right now. Spike Lee, very talented, but he's no longer at the top of the totem pole in terms of Hollywood directors. And there's a reason for that. So I want people to understand, or black men to understand, that they may be going into a very volatile situation to where they're not really welcome. But there is some leeway if they play by certain rules. And so what are those rules? And those rules is I kind of, I, I coined it as the liberal agenda. It's like, if you can demonstrate that you are for that agenda, then they're more apt to give you projects and more apt to work with you. But there is a ceiling and you have to be careful of that and, and be mindful of that. Well, let's talk about the, um, you, you mentioned something about um, people like Spike Lee, who's not considered, because there was a, a, you know, a time where, you know, wow, Spike Lee was you know, really, really cooking it up in, in, in Hollywood. Why is Spike Lee not considered a top um, producer and he's trying to uh, fund his own films now on Kickstarter.com, while you know somebody like Lee Daniels or Tyler Perry, who doesn't have the the history that Spike Lee does, and they're way more wealthier and way more successful than Spike Lee is now. Although Spike Lee, in my opinion, is a much better producer than they are. Exactly. So you know, um, I was at an event and it was to introduce a new online platform. And Spike was there, and him and I were talking. And basically, you know, um, Spike had admit, admitted that he was a novice to the online arena. So it's it's a couple of things. It's number one, us. Uh, you know, in in Hollywood, if you are a white director, you can have bomb after bomb after bomb, and they'll still give you a chance. They'll still give you a hundred million dollars, you know, to make a film. But if you're the black director, if you have one or maybe two, you're done. You know what I mean? And I think Spike Lee, um, you know, in picking certain projects, uh, picked projects that weren't mass uh, ma mainstream appeal, and they didn't do as well at the box office as he would have liked to. You know, um, so that hurt him as well. And also, um, I think Spike is a strong brother who does believe in the cause. And I think that is a threat to the current Hollywood structure. Okay, uh, now let, let, let's, let's talk about the proof that you can show that you're a part of this liberal agenda. Now, you're going to probably open some eyes here when you say that because it is kind of, um, uh, what's the word that I'm looking for? Uh, conspiracy theory type of thing. Like, but I know that you know, but you know, yeah. let's be fair, black people love conspiracy theories. Um, let's talk about, you know, let's say, for example, I'm Lee Daniels. Um, I, Tyler Perry, who Tyler Perry started off as a, you know, Christian, right? He's writing Christian plays. Um, how do I prove to those who have the money, like at Lion Gate and all these other people, how do I, how do I prove to them that I'm down with the agenda? Okay, for let's, let's understand one thing. Um, one of the big gripes that many have had, many um, actors, um, African-American actors, and um, people say that the studios don't have an African-American um, head to green light a black project. And that's true, you know? But you have to understand one thing, that, that the system is set up in a way that there is a culture. So I don't care if you do have um, an African-American who is the, the, the CEO of the studio, that doesn't mean that the ideology reflects that of black progression. You know what I mean? Say that again. Say that because that was so fucking important. Say that again so that we understand that. Because skin folk ain't always kin folk. Say that one more time. That's exactly right. I mean, you when you the heads of the studio put it this way: to get there are filtered out. They make sure that you are part of the culture. That in going and go, um, you know, going up the corporate ladder, there are certain things that you have to prove. You know what I mean? And that is that you're not going to be a radical or revolutionary. You know, that your mindset goes along with that culture. And we can see this from Obama. Obama, to get to where he was, he had to prove he was, he was not going to be a threat to the current system. You know what I mean? He was not going to push a, a black male agenda, African-American male agenda, which is like, you know, against, against mass incarceration, you know. Um, so 
we have to be very careful, um, and, and this is the same thing with corporate America. Just because you think you see three or four um, CEOs in corporate America, that doesn't mean that they reflect you know, um, the thinking that you and I may have in terms of how we view our people and how we view our plight. And it's very important. So for us to, to think that just because we see these figureheads that reflect our color, that that will make a change is absolutely wrong because you have to understand that when you have these, these studios, you have board of directors, you know, you have an accounting department that's looking at the numbers. You know, I mean, I, I you know, they're, they're very careful in who they allow into the, the upper echelon, you know, that, that top percentage. And you have to prove yourself to be, you know, non-threatening, you know, very submissive, go along with the program. And many brothers who work in corporate America can, can attest to this because if you see yourself, you know, I work in the the, the agency arena. So, you know, we, we come up with marketing campaigns and you hear this all the time where brothers are sitting around and they're afraid to speak up in these board meetings or, or, or you know, like articulate their ideas because, you know, they'll be quickly, um, you know, put down. So you have a, you have a situation where, even if you want, even if you had a brother or a sister who came along, who was radical, who wanted to make changes and do really good, the current culture will filter that individual out to where you'll get at the top a Barack Obama, somebody who's very, very watered down. You know. Let me let me ask you this because you're um, making some some excellent points, and thank you for educating us. And the audience, a lot of the brothers, I'm checking the chat right now. We have um, 75 people watching. Um, a lot of people are really, 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 really learning a lot of stuff. Shout out to Charles Gilmore, Wake the Hell Up, Master Will, um, and all the people in the chat. Um, let's talk about Monique because uh, Monique was a person, I mean, wow, what an incredible actress. Um, not only, you know, just as an actor on film, but a hell of an actor, or actress rather, um, in, in sitcom parodies, stuff like that. Um, why is a person with that level of talent, why is that person blackballed from Hollywood and why, and why is she have no chance of coming back? I know you kind of went into it, but in your opinion, she's super talented. Mm -hmm. You know, why isn't that they could be like, okay, well, we forgive you, come back. You know, you, you're a money maker. You can do this. What's the problem? Well, uh, Monique is a very outspoken sister, right? And she's not playing the game. Yeah. So she has to be very careful in what she says and what she does. She, and I think that what she did was when she saw an injustice, she ran to the media and she kind of like told on the system. And that's something you don't do in, in Hollywood. You don't, you don't, you don't rat out the, the system and how it operates. And I think that created a lot of problems for her. You see, she, she's a case in point of someone who didn't want to play by those same rules. And the, the system quickly put her on the peripheral. They filtered her out. And this is exactly um, what they do, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and this is something we have to, again, we're going into another man's patriarchy, right? We are guests, and we have to really understand that, you know? And I don't think we understand that. You know, um, when they had the, the, the Academy Awards where they didn't nominate any black films, I think Jada Smith came out and she said that we need to start our own Hollywood, right? Mm -hmm. And I kind of agreed with her in a way, but again, you have to understand that that's that you're declaring war on Hollywood, which is a global entity, and they're not going to just allow you to start a comp to start a, a company that's going to be competition against them. They're going to quickly like. They control the distribution outlets. If you control distribution, you control everything. You control the money, you know? So, um, you know, I see these young brothers coming up and saying, you know, I'm going to get to Hollywood. I'm going to make these films. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And the one thing, and I'm going to tie this back to what you were saying about Spike Lee. And another point to that is I, I think that Spike Lee's agenda when he got in there was to make great films, right? Mm -hmm. But my perspective, if I were in his position, my agenda would be to create a studio. Robert Townsend tried to do this way back and it wasn't successful. And I think that's what you got to really focus on because eventually, you, if you are true to who you are and, and trying to help our people, you're going to fall out of favor with the system. And if you have your own means of financing, if you have your own studio, your own company, then you can, you can just like parlay that into your own, take that money and parlay it into your own films. And you don't have to depend on something. You're not censored. You don't have to watch what you say and get blacklisted like Monique. You can just keep making films. And I think that what happened was that Spike started out and the, 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 the industry was very open armed to him and he financed his films, but he didn't realize that eventually that financing may dry up. And 
I think he should have focused more so on building whether it's an online platform or a mini studio to bankroll his own films. And I think that's exactly what Tyler Perry did. And Tyler Perry formed joint ventures with different studios that co-financed his productions and allowed him to build a studio of his own. That's what we need to be doing. Now, here's the thing. Um, when Jada Smith talked about us starting a, a black Hollywood, right? Mm -hmm. I thought that was great. But then the question becomes, where's that money going to come from? Making films in Hollywood is a very expensive endeavor. Very expensive. In fact, I think the statistics are like for every five films that Hollywood produces, four are bombs. One is successful, but that one success can help pay for the, the four that, that failed at the box office. But mm -hmm. the more important thing is Hollywood has Wall Street behind it. They have the banks behind them. So mm -hmm. the banks are lending Hollywood money and giving Hollywood credit to make film after film after film. So if Jade is talking about starting a, a, a black Hollywood, where's that money gonna come from? What banks or, or lending institutions are gonna give us the money to make film after film after film? Again, let's do the numbers. You've gotta make five films in hopes that one will be successful. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And you're competing with an industry that can cut off your mode of distribution, which is the theater chains. So you're going to have your own distribution outlets. So there's a lot of thinking behind this. And I think that we become so passionate and we want things so much, we don't think about things in, in the correct way. Now, I think that Jada is connected with the right people to where she could have went to um, the very wealthy people in Hollywood, kind of like what Spike Lee did with Malcolm X. When he ran out of funding, he started to fund it from uh, black celebrities like Bill Cosby. So I think that Jada could go to these people and say, listen, let's fund our own studio. Let's work together to compete against Hollywood. You can do that, but also think about what Hollywood may do. They may blacklist those um, well-known actors and stars who are trying to finance a black Hollywood because, again, you're competing against them, and they don't want that kind of competition. So uh, it, there, there is a, a great amount of difficulty in doing this, but it's doable. We just have to do it in the right way. But I don't think it's, it's wise for us just to say, let's do this as if it's so easy to do and accomplish. Now, another problem I see, um, just I don't want to be long-winded, but mm -hmm. those, uh, when we get into the industry, we don't get in there with a clear objective. Mm -hmm. We do exactly this. We get in there with the idea of a simulation. I want to get into the system you know, as an actor, filmmaker, or screenwriter, and I, want this, and I just want to work in the industry. Mm -hmm. Your goal should not be just to work. Your goal should be to build platforms so that you don't have to depend on the system to keep financing you, to keep to, because when they give you their money, there's a, a, a lot of censorship that comes with that. You're not free to do what you want. And case in point, the, the, the new Star Wars film that came out, The Force Awakens, J.J. Abrams had to go along with that feminist agenda. You know, he's a great director, but I know Disney brought him on and said, here's the script, you direct, we want you to do this. Now, when a director comes along with a big franchise like that, it's paint by the numbers. You don't have a lot of leeway to do your, what you want because there's so much money at stake that they're just going to say, we like you as a director, direct this movie the way we want it so that we can merchandise and sell toys and, and, and kind of hook up with McDonald's and, and, and sell Happy Meals. Mm -hmm. They don't want you to rock the boat. So if, uh, if you think as a director or actor you're getting into an industry, Mm -hmm. That's going to give you freedom of speech. It's going to allow you to do another Malcolm X or Marcus Garvey movie. You better think about it because Nat, uh, Nat, Nate Parker had to go outside the Hollywood system to get the, what is it, the $20 million to finance Birth of a Nation. The studios wouldn't finance that, you know? Mm -hmm. Let me let ask you this. Oh, oh. Uh, so we're echoing here. So what I'm going to do is this. When you start talking again, Go back to your computer and hit the mic so because you're on mute right now only because it's echoing, okay? Okay, so when you go back up, just hit the mute. So let me ask you this because it's um, uh, something I wanted, you want your opinion on. Uh, we now have uh, Nollywood. Now, it's not us, but it's the Nigerian uh, Hollywood. Kind of corny. I saw some, some movies there. But it's, it's like the second or third biggest movie industry in the world. Uh, Nigeria has their own movie industry. I don't know who the fuck finances them, but it's very popular. They have some good movies out there too. What do you think about Nollywood? And if Nigeria can do it, can black people do something like that? Well, here's the difference. I think the United States is probably uh, the only place where the arts aren't funded by the government. You know what I mean? So you, when you look at Nigeria, I'm pretty sure the Nigerian government is, is funding those programs to make those films. You know what I mean? 
So uh, that's a whole different platform in terms of where financing is coming from, right? And I think that what they're doing is great because that small beginning, kind of like what Bollywood is doing, I think it's a small beginning and a step in the right direction. And I wish that we would kind of emulate that. So I'm not sure if that answers your question, though. But. Okay, so uh, Nollywood, I don't know who's bigger. I think Bollywood must be bigger because India. Bollywood, has, yeah, Bollywood has a because India has how many people? Almost uh, a billion. Uh, yes, yeah, a lot of people. Okay. So India has a billion people. Nollywood is the third largest market. So obviously, Nigeria is making you know their films are selling not only you know probably throughout Africa. You know, um, what what's stopping African Americans from going to let's say I'm, I'll be in I'll be in Uganda on Monday. What's stopping us from starting a movie industry in a place like Tanzania, Liberia, Ghana, and just starting it there and not necessarily trying to compete with Hollywood in America, but you know, we're somewhere competing in Africa or to the diaspora. What's stopping us from doing something like that? Well, you know what? I don't think that we, do, we, do, we would do that because most of the resources are here in this country. You know, so if you want camera equipment, if you want, and you have the unions, you have the, you have the most skilled labor here in the country. Mm -hmm. So going out there, you're going to have a problem of resources, and that's going to be a very difficult thing for you to do. Right here, if I want to uh, shoot a film, I can easily get a crew together and, and shoot something, and I have editing facilities, I have sound mixing facilities. Out there, it's going to be a bit difficult to get all those resources together. So I think that's one of the things that's that's going to be a great hurdle for us to do. And I think that if we did do that, I think that would be great. But I, I don't see that as happening. And again, it goes back to most of distribution. Are, are the distribution outlets there? They're not. They're here. I got it. Okay. Let me do this. Um, Blackest Night is from uh, Nigeria. He says uh, uh, Nollywood is uh, privately funded. Um, I don't know about Bollywood. Uh, also, shout out to Charles Gilmore, uh, always helping out in the chat. Um, in the Geo Scholar, uh, let me let me ask you this. So, you know, what about black men in the roles that you know? You wrote an article about the emasculation of black men. Wonderful article. Can you go into a little bit more detail about what made you want to uh, write that article and your experience as you've seen Hollywood change towards African American men? Yeah, I think what's what's going on now is I think that black men in general. Um, and I always look at black men as the leaders. You know, we have to step up, we have to create businesses, we have to be captains of industry. And I don't think that we really understand what's going on in Hollywood. Let me just say it this way. Hollywood is a great, uh, it's a great town, it's a great industry to make dreams come true and to express yourself as an artist, but it also is a gigantic propaganda machine. So it has an agenda, and I, I, I keep going back to that because we don't realize that the images that we see on screen are not just there for um, creative expression. It's there to communicate a message and a meaning, and we, we don't understand that. And I, let, let me go back to this. One of my favorite films is Luc Besson's The Fifth Element, and I love that film. It's, it's just like awesome. But one thing I couldn't understand about that film is why is Chris Tucker running around screaming like a girl? And when you look at that isolated, you don't, you know, you don't, realize so much, but then if you look at Will Smith's Hitch, and then you start looking at a lot of the films, you see that there's a pattern, and the pattern is that black men aren't allowed to be men. You know, we're always emasculated in some way, and when you talk about putting a dress on, that's just, that's just a little part of what's going on. It's, it's, it's bigger than that, and if you look at the totality of it, it's how are we allowed to be real lovers on screen? No, we're not. You know, I, I call it the Captain Kirk syndrome. Captain Kirk, as a, as a white male, can come on and screw every woman that there is. She can be green and purple. But for a black man to um, do that, it causes an uprising. Because essentially, um, Hollywood's problem is the problem that affected the country as a whole, meaning that there is a fear of black male masculinity. And Dr. Frances Quest Welsing in her book, The ISIS Papers, talked a lot about this when she said that it's from genetic annihilation, that um, you know, the white population is afraid that, that they could be wiped out off the face of the earth. And you know, when we look at the census, the census bureau and all that, we see that the white population, the birth rate is going down. So a lot of this is reflected in Hollywood. And what they're trying to really communicate is that you know, um, anything that has to do with black male masculinity, they call it Toxic, toxic, toxic masculinity is a threat to the system. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things I see that 
over and over again. And his blatant messages, you saw the film Hancock, where um, you know Will Smith supposedly played the superhero character with superpowers, but what was his kryptonite? Charlize Theron, a, a white woman. So there were, he couldn't have a, a relationship with her because they were afraid of, of that, again, black male masculinity, you know? And I found that so insulting, but it's a common theme in every film that, that's out there. And if we can go to this film, Get Out, which recently came out by Jordan Peele, which, um, you know, I, I, when I saw the trailers to it, I, I kind of knew what that film was going to be about. And I said, well, it's getting good reviews and uh, it was good reviews on Rotten, Rotten Tomatoes. So I said, um, let me um, go check it out. And it was exactly what I expected. It was, uh, and I wrote this in my piece, it's a propaganda film. If you see the film, one of the things that it does is it appeals to black women and white males, you know? And that, and being that, um, the main character um, of, of, of Rose and Chris, which is, um, I think his name is Chris, I think the actor's name is Chris, um, Chris Washington, that they could not, um, the, the, well, I'm gonna give a spoiler alert. Rose turns out to be this evil white girl, right? So their relationship was all a facade. It could never really mushroom into a real relationship. This is again the common theme that we see, where he's not allowed to be a real man. He's not allowed to have a relationship with various different women. And so I said this. I said, would Jordan Peele have ever got financing for that film if um, Rose and the brother in the film had a very like you know cordial, harmonious relationship at the end? No, he would have never got funding for that film because there had to be an agenda. There had to be a message communicated that appeal to black women, because black women don't want to see black men with white women. Um, and it appealed to the white racist men who don't want to see black men with white women. So this film was ripe for Hollywood. It goes back to what I was saying about this agenda. If you play by that agenda, then you're given a lot of latitude. So Jordan Peele, he was right, you know, he was, he gave them exactly what they wanted. But again, what I said before stands, if the ending of that film had those two characters having a harmonious, loving relationship, then that film would never have got green light by the studio system. Mm -hmm. That's an excellent fucking point. I never thought about uh, Get Out movie uh, like that, right? Um, yeah, that makes a lot of fucking sense. Wow. Uh, let me do this real quick. We are going to take a little bit of a break here. Once again, uh, this is an excellent guess, uh, brothers. Now, also, um, want you to, uh, brothers, to understand that uh, we are loving to give you the content that we're doing. Thank you for all of those who are um, participating in the chat. Shout out to CJ Sims, Charles Gilmore, Master Will. Uh, do me a favor, brothers, while we're doing this. Uh, Theron Williams, let's get the likes up on the videos. We have 135 people watching right now, so show your love, like the video. Now, the reason why I'm having you like the video is because uh, we need to promote it on YouTube and it gets more uh, views. Now, many of you know, uh, Monday I will be out of the country. So, you know, we have Thursday, Friday, tonight, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So you, you guys won't get any content from me for about 11 days on this channel. So you want to make sure that you enjoy it while you can. And while I'm on here, uh, let me only thank Ron, but let's promote the article that he wrote. Um, Hollywood and the emasculation of the black male image. He writes under Kiss, I can't even say it. How do you say it? Kassam Ma Kepuru. Kassam Ma Kepuru, yeah. yeah. Is, I don't know how to say that. But that's what he writes under on the actual website. So um, if you see him, that is also him. So I'm going to go into the chat, brothers, and uh, you can see his particular uh, article here. So make sure that you um, subscribe to him. And also we'll have him give out his information uh, that you can follow him on social media, whatever he's doing. Now, Ryan, let me ask you this. Um, a question was posed by uh, Charles uh, Gilmore III, who was a moderator. And what he's pretty much asking is, you know, let's hypothetically, you know, say that black people, um, we do get our own uh, movie theaters or movie industry or movie studio. Um, how, how then do we go about distributing movies to our audience? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, what we have to look, the main thing is, what I say is, um, we have to look what's trending, right? And, and, and where things are going. And um, let me just take a step back before I can answer that question in terms of how we can distribute our own films and all that. Um, 
we have to have an agenda, a kind of, I hate to say black nationalist agenda, but we have an agenda to look at the objective of where we want to go. Every group, especially the immigrant group that came to this country, they got into a certain market and dominated that market. When we look at the, like for the Irish, they mastered shipbuilding, right? The Italians got into constructions, you know, um, the Jews built Hollywood, right? And these groups, you know, created their empires of their own. So we have to think about where is the future going? And we have to get in there and start dominating. Right now, the future is online content, producing movies for, for streaming content. If we look at Amazon, Netflix, Hulu, all of them are starting out showing movies, but eventually they move over to producing original content. And I think that's where the future is going. And why? Because it takes very little capital to start your own platform in that direction. And then yeah. from monetizing it, you can, Take that money and make a lot into producing your own films. The problem is, very, a lot of us don't want to start out small. We want to produce Star Wars. We want a hundred million dollar budget, and we're fooled by the Hollywood system into thinking that's easily accessed by us. And the reason that we're fooled, let me go back to Get Out. After Jordan Peele did that film, he was praised by the industry, right? They were saying, well, now he has his pick of the litter of scripts. He's going to be directing this, directing that. All that is PR mumbo jumbo. He will never get the budget that a Spielberg will get. He will never get the budget as the Francis Ford Coppola will get. You know what I mean? He's always going to be pigeonholed to small budgets. Look at Tyler Perry. His films are small budgets. This is what they do to black directors. So you have to think about that. Ava DuVernay, when she did uh, Selma, right? So she's praised for that film and all that. And then they're talking about, oh, you know, J.J. Uh, Abrams may be considering her to direct the next Star Wars. You know, that's just PR bullshit. You know what I mean? They're not going to give her Star Wars, you know, but they have to they have to put out this illusion that there's equality in Hollywood, that if you're an artist, if you express your dream and your vision, that you can, too can be, you know, the, the next Spielberg. You, too, can be, you know, the next whatever. But that's not necessarily true because you're always going to be limited. And if you look at across the board, African-American directors don't command the same budgets as white directors in Hollywood. And the same thing with white females. They don't sometimes don't get as much money as their white male counterparts to produce films, you know? Mm -hmm. Now, we need to start looking at ways to where we can counter that. And the online platforms, if we get in there, the door of opportunity is open. We can get in there with small, a little bit of capital, a little bit of money, and stop, start to dominate that market. And, and what we need to do is get in there and close it off and command it. You try to get into the construction business and see what happens. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You try to get into shipbuilding and see what happens. These, these individuals, these, these ethnic groups, have dominated. It's closed off. They won't let you take it over. So we're not going to get into Hollywood, and we're not going to take over Hollywood. We will get pieces of the pie, but we're not going to get the whole pie. So we have to start thinking eventually, like, how what, we have to make a home for ourselves, and what are we going to do to achieve that? The way we achieve that is to stop going into the industry and trying to assimilate. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if you look at uh, the one thing about, I always say with uh, black people is that, we don't understand that we have enemies from within and enemies from and without. So you look at like Latinos, Asians, right? They, they operate based on tribalism. You know, they'll get into the industry and they're gonna hire their own, but they won't hire us. Even though it was our people, Dr. Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, that were the progressives during the civil rights era and without them, they would not enjoy the freedoms they have today. But they don't care, they don't care. But we start thinking, oh, there are Latino brothers and sisters, our Asian brothers and sisters. They don't look at us that way. You know, George Lopez gets his own sitcom. And who does George Lopez hire and put on the sitcom? All uh, Mexicans, Latinos. Doesn't hire any black people. Cosby gets his sitcom. What does he do? He hires blacks, Asians. He's multicultural, right? We have to be a little bit more selfish and understand that that these individuals are operating based on the totem pole. The totem pole says white people at the top, black people at the bottom, everybody else is in the middle, and they're walking over us to get up to the top so they can assimilate into a system. They're not looking to get into the Hollywood system and revolutionize it and change things to make it better for everybody and more equal. They're looking to get in there and to, to you know, like, to, uh, be on par with white people, you know, and, and, and kind of crush us in doing so. Mm -hmm. Let me let me ask you. What well, you're making some great points, and people in the chat are also um, saying that you're making great points too. Let me let me talk to you about this because you're saying that you know uh, you may 
I'm, I'm not going to say that you said this, but what I'm thinking that you're saying is, hey, online, um, it's an easy entry to get into online movies, streaming movies, because, you know, obviously it's hell of a hard to get into shipbuilding. It's going to take, you know, there's a lot of difficulty in entry into something like that. So you're saying that, you know, black content creators and uh, I'm not a movie producer, but I'm a black content creator. Obviously, it's, you know, hardly no cost, if anything, to, to get into that online because it's a free market. Well, let me ask you this, in your opinion. If a black person wants to start their first film, they want to start off small. Right. Because you said a lot of people don't want to do that. But kind of give us if you were starting off small. You wanted to shoot some sort of documentary or film, um, and you were directing it. Um, what is the budget that you need at the local level that you think you can pull it off with to do everything you need to do to produce this pr production? Right. Um, it depends on the storyline. It depends on what you're producing. Right now, what I'm seeing as far as uh, filmmakers are concerned, they're trying to cheat their way in. They're producing these so-called films. They're calling it films, but they're not narrative stories. They're sort of like documentaries where they're going around interviewing a bunch of people. They're calling themselves filmmakers. Well, that's nice and dandy, but that's kind of like a, a, a documentary, but it's a cheap way of doing things. We need to um, start to... Um, start to master storytelling. There was there was one consistent theme that I saw when I started, I, I went to Cannes Film Festival, I did the festival circuit. I don't like doing the festival circuit. But there was one theme that I kind of saw when I, I went to these festivals, especially the black film festivals, was that we're not, we haven't mastered the craft of filmmaking. We, we have not. We're not very good storytellers. We, we have a point and shoot mentality. We think because we capture an image that we're now cinematic geniuses. You know, we've got to like study great filmmakers. When I say great filmmakers, I'm talking about like Stanley Kubrick. You know what I'm saying? I'm talking about Orson Welles, you know, and people say, oh, they're white filmmakers. Why are we? No, they're good filmmakers. You know, don't <laughs> I'm going thing going, you know what I mean? And yeah, you, 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 can, you can start studying Spike Lee's stuff. You can start studying Tyler Perry's stuff if you want. But you, you've got to start, one of my favorite films is, is Chinatown with Jack Nicholson because the film is told all in visuals. So, uh, you know, look at 2001 Space Odyssey. We have to study that. But the main thing is um, your, your storyline is going to dictate your budget, all right? And the more creative you are, I think the less money you need. One of the best books you can read is Rodriguez, A Rebel Without a Cause. And in that film, he talks about how he made his first, in that book, he talked about how he made his first film with practically almost no money, a camera and a couple of lights. And, and you know, he didn't have really good sound equipment, you know. So it's really up to you to be creative. Um, now, in terms of uh, getting real money, I would say, like, you know, um, if you're going to make a narrative film, I say, you know, a good place to start is to get together maybe ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000. And the, the, what, Another thing I noticed is that the quality is lacking. We don't have good sound design. We don't have good cinematography. So quality is very, very important, you know? So that, I think, if you focus on that, you're gonna, you're gonna kind of, um, you're more apt to get the attention of, of Hollywood in getting a distribution deal. Okay, let, let me kind of go back to these markets like um, Bollywood or Nollywood. I don't know how much uh, experience you have with, with them. Um, have you seen any movies from Nollywood or Bollywood? Yeah, I have, and they're crazy. Yeah. <laughs> okay. What? Which more? Which more are you more? Um, well, they, I think they, they. I think they're. It, it's tricky because I think they're ambitious and they're trying to duplicate the Hollywood films with you know action and and, and effects and all that. And I don't think it's. It, it looks great, but I appreciate kind of like the effort. And some of it is really good, high quality, um, but it, it hasn't really captured my attention. You know what I mean? I, I, I don't think it has captured mass appeal here in the states. What would you do different if you were a Nollywood director? Um, you know what you can do, and I think this would go a long way, is to get an A-list a actor from the United States. That's Somebody just said it in the chat. Somebody yeah. just said it in the chat. Uh, now, it, let's say Nollywood does a movie with um, Will Smith. Uh, definitely Nigerians have money, so I wouldn't see why, they, why he wouldn't do it. What kind of shockwave would that send throughout Hollywood? Well, let's look at it this way, okay? Um, there was a film company years ago, I think it was called the Canon Films, the Canon Brothers, and they came along with a very novel idea. They were gonna produce these kind of low budget films that would compete against Hollywood. How would they compete against Hollywood? They would do two things. Number one, they would um, enlist actors from Hollywood. They would pay actors to be in their films and they would create their own stars. You know, kind of like what Oscar Michelle, Michelle did, you know? 
Mm. Um, so I think that, you know, they don't have to get a Will Smith. You know, they can, they can get somebody, you know, not as, as top as Will Smith, but I think that if they start, if they start working with, with actors, you know, they can hire Monique. They, they can do that. They, if they start doing that, then, then the eyes of the world will start focusing on Nollywood more, you know? Mm. And they will need to work with, I think, United States screenwriters to, to produce, a, you know, better stories, black screenwriters. So the story, the story line is, is definitely lacking. Okay, shout out to Viper Black. Um, for the the uh, one dollar uh, donation here, uh, I guess let's talk in terms of of you personally, um, because we've talked about Hollywood, we've talked about um, other things. Let's talk about you, Ron, the filmmaker. Um, knowing what you know now as a as a black man, and you uh, you've seen these things that are uh, are going in Hollywood as an insider. Uh, what are your plans? Because you know all of this information, you know how this works, you know what the odds are, you know, are, are stacked against you. What do you plan to do to further your own personal career? And you what know, are your actual plans? You know, it's interesting because I think every, you know, I, I, I started out as a filmmaker and I was hoping to get awards as a, um, a director and I started getting awards for screenwriting, which was a shock to me. They were like, oh, you're a great screenwriter, you know. But you know, you know, I started out, I produced my first feature film, which was called Bugged. And I actually got financing from a studio to do that, surprisingly, I didn't want that. And then um, we started to do like, um, we pitched that to Disney and I think it was Universal Pictures. And we actually pitched that Universal Pictures to do, to have Will Smith star in that. So that didn't happen, but it was, it was a very interesting experience. And I can tell you this experience from when we did the pitch with Disney is um, when I was there, um, it was me, the head of the, stu the, head of the, the studio that I was working with, and we were sitting in the lobby, and the woman comes out, um, and she asked me, for one thing, if you go to Disney, it, it's, it's, it's immaculate. So they have like, money like crazy. So she comes out, and she asked me, would I like milk and cookies? <laughs> I was just laughing. I said, really? You guys are going to give me milk and cookies? I was like, sure. You know, I'm a vegan, so I wasn't going to really eat it, but I wanted to see if she was just joking. So she comes out with milk and cookies, you know? And I was like, oh my God, these guys, Disney, they really live this stuff, you know? And so that was one of the, um, the best experiences of my life. And then from there, I got a, a major agent. But I, I bring it up because my first film, Bug, was a horror film, right? And I kind of was peppering in their, in their messages. And as I evolved as a filmmaker, you know, you, you come to this thing of, well, what, it, what is the content of your film going to be about? Is it going to be about a message? Um, or is it going to be about just pure entertainment? And as I got older and more experienced as a filmmaker, I started looking around. I started seeing what was going on in Hollywood. And I started saying, Hollywood is not what I think it is. It's not equal. I just can't get in there and I can't be on par with George Lucas, you know? And I was like, wow. And it was a shock to my system because I always thought I didn't see things in terms of color. So then my message started to change. I became a little bit more political in my content. And I also started studying a lot of different things. I started studying like NLP, hypnosis, and I found that I can, and, and you know, comedic science, I found that I can draw on all that and put that into my content and my story. But it always came back to um, putting a message in my films. And most recently I did a film called War is a Bitch. And it's, it's a war film with all women. And you can check that out. Just go to uh, warisabitchshort.com. And that dealt with the, the issue of how there's a grand conspiracy, is what you mentioned before, to get racial groups and gender groups to fight each other. And I began to see that that was what Hollywood was about, it was about creating these factions, whether it be liberal, conservative, you know, male, female, and having them fight each other. And, and I see that as a common theme in, in what's going on in the country. And that, that keeps what I call the global elite, the one percenters, in control because it's easier to control a population that's fragmented than one that's united, you know? So that was expressed in my films. And I recently did another film called uh, White Power, which got over um, a million hits on YouTube. And you can see that at uh, White Power web series, and we're developing that into a web series. And it specifically talks about the things I did in my article, which was the emasculation of the black male image. And it deals with, um, how white supremacists have infiltrated certain aspects of, of society and are trying um, through various means to emasculate black men to, to depopulate the country, um, depopulate the country for, with, you know, they don't want people of color to produce. You know, they see us as like uh, pests or insects, you know. 
Um, so that's basically where I'm going. And you know, with my my web experience, like I said, I've worked for a lot of companies and um, developed a lot of websites. So I kind of merged the two. And so I'm working on platforms that stream movies, and more importantly, I like helping filmmakers. Um, what I call hack the system. I say this is what the industry is about. This is what you can expect. This is the challenges. Now, with all that said, I don't want to paint a very dim picture of what you can achieve. You know, my thing is understand the terrain, understand what you're getting into, and 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 make a way for yourself. Break in there and and just do what you can to get in there. But always keep. The goal in mind is to become independent, build a platform for yourself because you don't have to depend on the system to keep bankrolling your films. Let, let's talk about this. Um, and shout out to Godmo, shout out to Black Night, the Geo Scholar. Again, um, Theron Williams, I'm trying to get him on here, but he's uh, always driving, so hopefully he'll wake the hell up. Um, <laughs> let, me, let, me ask you, let me ask you this. Um, in Bathsheba says, I want to learn more from him. Oh, he's definitely going to come back because he's a hell of an interview. Uh, you know, we talked about studio production, and you talked about owning your own studio. I, I you know, I, my mind just started thinking of, uh, of numbers that I probably don't know anything about. When you talk about owning your own studio, how much money is that and what is inside of this studio? Because when we, we think of a studio, most people, I mean, because this is a, you know, 90% black audience, we're thinking like a rap studio or something. Right, we we don't know what a movie studio is and what it entails. Can you be so kind to talk to us about, um, you know, the movie studio, um, you know, what it would start off as? Uh, let's say if you were to do a movie studio, um, what what does it entail? What the equipment is, what the cameras are that we're working with? Yeah, you know, it, Spielberg started his own studio. I think it was SKG because um, he he had so much money and he got his uh, wife at the time to go around to pitch the idea of. Uh, his own studio to investors, you know, and he, and he made it happen, you know. This is something, O'Shea, that we can do in our lifetime. The, the problem that we have, I mean, you know, I look at this and I'm saying, there's nothing preventing us from doing it. But you have to understand, black males in particular have a hard time working together. You know, we, oh, we, yeah. <laughs> we suffer from jealousy, we suffer from envy, you know, and, and we're constantly fighting each other. For no, no reason. I always say that there's a built, you know, it's coming from slavery. You know, I think that we have a built-in self-destruct mechanism, you know, because every time we come together, we, we implode, you know. Um, and we can see this, what happened with Malcolm X, the Nation of Islam. You know, we can see this from what happened with Marcus Garvey. You know, he, he was brought down from the inside, you know. So we have to be a little more cognizant of what's going on and work together because mm -hmm. This is a reality. We can build a studio. Now, what does a studio involve? Again, we need to go back and read that book, An Empire of Their Own, you know, how the Jewish immigrants built Hollywood. They started out small, right? And um, I worked with a, 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 a guy by the name of, um, he, he heads Trauma Pictures, right? And how he started out, he produced the movie The Toxic Avenger. I don't know if you guys are, are aware of that film, The Toxic Avenger. It's a cult classic. You know, and from there, the movie became such a hit that he took that money, he bankrolled it into a, a mini studio. And he invited me to take a tour of his studio in Hell's Kitchen. And I was just like, wow, this is this operation is awesome. And he had lawyers. He, he had, you know, uh, he had uh, PRs, uh, PR company in this in the building. So he had all of these different divisions working within the building. And we can we can do this. But again, I think that the door of opportunity is open in the online platform. We have to start looking at that, starting small and, and taking that money and having it mushroom into something bigger. Mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're so afraid of, you see, Hollywood, they, they, they create this illusion that you can be an overnight success, you can be a multimillionaire. That is, for most people, it is not so. All right, mm -hmm. let's, let's get that. And the only way it can, can happen if you learn to hack the system. I, I do, I work with programming and all that. So I, I've always looked at things as, how do I hack this program? How do I hack this website? How do I hack what Hollywood so I can get in there? Let's, let's go back and look at, there were two great periods that allowed filmmakers, regardless of color, to get into the industry. The first one was during the 90s, which brought you people like um, Robert Townsend, Spike Lee into the business, right? And that was when the 90s, when this, the, the films that Hollywood was producing was 
not the film, I'm sorry, the actors were commanding such a large salary in Hollywood mm -hmm. that Hollywood started to say, you know, we don't want to pay these actors like Schwarzenegger all this money. We're going to look at independent films. So if an independent filmmaker comes along like a Michael Moore with a movie or Robert Rodriguez with a movie, we're going to buy it from him for $10 million and then we're going to show those actors, Sylvester Sloan and, and, and you know, like, um, on a Schwarzenegger, that we don't need them. We can take this independent film, distribute it, and make a lot of money. And that was one of those periods where the opportunity was open for independent filmmakers to get in and dominate. The next period came when the internet and um, bandwidth started to open up and online streaming started to happen. And now what happened is you see a lot, a lot of white um, male filmmakers who produce short films, put those films online, and based on those short films, got Hollywood deals. That was the next period where you know Hollywood was open to looking at bringing filmmakers in. That door is slowly closing, you know. Mm -hmm. So what I think that we need to do, on a very basic level, is just it doesn't take a lot of money. Filmmakers, for example, like myself, like say for example myself and the Tariq Nasheed get together and we say, listen, we're going to create a platform. We're going to produce movies on this platform. We're going to self-distribute them. You pay a small fee, monetize the site, and we can stream that to people. Take that money, parlay it into the next film, and keep bankrolling films, films, mm -hmm. and eventually we'll get to the point of where we have a large film studio like a Paramount, a Universal Pictures, a Columbia Pictures. I definitely agree. Let me do this and get some shout outs. Um, I want to piggyback on your point. My man, Eastwood302, 20 hour super chat, great content this week. I'll say, say shout out to Africa, brother. Thank you, brothers. Thank you. Uh, Darkface, $10. Uh, Richard, H109, $10. Get the likes up. Let me do this. Uh, let me just say this, man. I have, uh, even though this is a smaller channel, um, and my other channel couldn't go live for three months. You guys know I had got a call to strike on that one. Um, you guys, man, have come through so much. Uh, just on this small channel, when I started, it was zero subscribers, up to like eight. 8,500. Um, I'm not even working on my, for my big channel. I appreciate all the brothers uh, that have come on um, to help me in any way, whether like the videos, um, whether um, to donate in the super chat, whether to say some encouraging words. Um, I really, I really, really from the bottom of my heart, thank you guys. Uh, the reason why we bring on the professionals, like whether it's Alan Roger Curry, uh, whether it's Ronald K. Armstrong, uh, whether it's um, other people that are pretty much, um, you know, an expertise. We bring this information uh, for black men. It's the conversations that we need to have. We need to have these kind of discussions. We need to go ahead and 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 and, and do this. So uh, I thank you for you brothers for your support and what you guys have been doing. This is, you know, I'm very humble to do this. I'm very humble, you know, to bring on a, a very very bright guy uh, like Ron. He's super super bright, super intelligent. And um, the platform that we have at the NegroManosphere.com allows for brothers that have this sort of talent to you know come on um, to do this. And by the way, uh, in the works, brothers, and you guys know I'm always do this. Um, the Negro Manosphere will be its own YouTube channel. Okay, so that will happen within the next six to twelve months. So basically, the Negro Manosphere is a website. But the Negro Manosphere will be its own YouTube channel that will feature content from particular YouTubers. You know, it will be just like a conglomerate. Um, you can go to the Negro Manosphere and see all your favorite YouTubers with exc exclusive content that you don't see on any channel. So, you know, hopefully a guy like, you know, Jap, our, 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 our Angry Man, our, our BJS Ibmore, our Brotherhood Lessons, they will all be on one channel with me and the Obsidian, and then you basically will go and just watch a Negro Manosphere video, and is this new content coming from different subscribers every day? That's what I'm looking to do. So let me kind of go back to your 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 point, Ron, because you said something that was so amazing. Um, you said black men can't work together, um, and you you've cited several reasons. You cited well, Marcus Garvey. I'll get to that later. Uh, Marcus Garvey, I don't think he could have worked with anybody, but um, but Elijah Muhammad and Malcolm X. Um, let me say this before I get to back to your point of view. The, the NegroManosphere.com, um, which is catered for all black men, a black male voice. When I first had the idea, somebody told me I will not call that person name. Said you're fucking crazy. I said why? You're, you're trying to build a platform for the one of the most dysfunctional groups of people in the world. Um, these niggas will not give any money to support it. Uh, you know, they won't read it. 
Um, it, it's, it's even if you try to give it to them, they're going to try to, you know, it's something that you can't do. Dealing with black men is a fucking pain in the ass. Uh, let, let me, let me, let me ask your impression of that. Cause you've been working in Hollywood. Why is it so difficult working with black men in general, in particular, you know, in, in your opinion? Well, it's because, you know, we have such, we do have a low self-esteem, right? And the, the, the jealousy thing with us is so strong. And, um, you know, just for me personally, my experience, I can only give you that. You know, when I've worked um, and I've, I've been successful, I've uh, had friends who, who say things like this. Well, you're not black enough. You, you know, you're, you're not black enough. You don't, know, you don't know what you're doing, you know. You think you're uppity now. You know, and these were people I, I've known since college, and I was like, well, why are you acting this way? You know, I, I never realized that black men had this issue. You know what I mean? And, and you know, it, it just seems like the crabs in the barrel mentality, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's unfortunate, but it's the reality. And it's gonna, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you, it's going to take a lot of effort for us to overcome that because um, let me put it to you this way. I'm going to be honest with you. I have, um, I have two attorneys, right, mm -hmm. that I work with. And these guys are probably some of the, the, the greatest people I've ever worked with. They taught me a lot. The, um, they're, they're both Jewish. They, oh. they went out of their way to help me. They did not have to help me at all. And if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be where I am now in terms of filmmaking. Mm -hmm. the, the gentleman um, who financed my first feature film, um, he was head of the studio. He was white. He was Jewish. So what I'm saying is that, you know, and, and let me give you this story, okay? Can I give you this little story? This is funny. Sure. I was at, um, at the time, I think it was called Payne Weber, which is a you know, finance, a finance firm, right? I think they call it UBS now, right? I was working in a brokerage department. I was very bold, so I put together a proposal to finance a film, um, which was Bugged, my first film, and you guys can find that online and YouTube. Um, and I went around the entire company soliciting people for an investment, right? And um, I, was, I was not like, on it, quiet about it at all. I was, I was like, I was working there as a temp. I didn't give a care who found out. Well, I remember, um, you know, my girlfriend at the time was an attorney, and I and I, she kept warning me you had to be very very careful. So anyway, I got a call the next day, and it was the legal department. They wanted me to come up there, and I said, Oh my God, I'm busted. I'm in trouble. So I walked up to the legal department, and I saw this big table, and around it was all these black lawyers. And they go, Ron, we hear that you've been soliciting people for investments in this company. I'm like, oh, shoot. Yes, I have. They said, well, we'd like to hear your, your, your proposal because we're interested in investing. I was like, wow, okay. So do you know I sat there and pitched the project, and a week later, not one invested? <laughs> but you know who invested? The white people in the company all invested. <laughs> and I'm like, why is it so difficult for black people to work together and to, to, help, to give us money so we can do projects together, you know? And these were, these were people, these were lawyers who had money. The, the white people that gave me money were like, they weren't, they weren't rich at all. They didn't have money, but they gave me two, $3,000 to the film, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I, I thought that was interesting, you know. So let me let me ask you this, and I, I've I've noticed this also uh, with, with, with black men. Like black men have a spending. Okay, if, if the if the black uh, spending power in the United States, and we're not talking about what's in Nigeria because we never really know how much money is in Nigeria because Nigeria is so fucking corrupt. We never know how much money is really there. I mean, we just know what GDP. But underground, who knows how much money they have? So you have you know blacks in Britain. You have blacks in the diaspora, you have blacks in South, you have black, well, you know, black men in America, if we just stick with that group, we probably have at least a $500 billion spending power, at least. Because the, the, the black spending power is 1.2 or 3 trillion, so they say. So then I'm assuming the black male spending power of 40% of that group is at least 500 billion, low ball. Mm -hmm. With the spending power of $500 billion, Can black men, what can black men create with that type of money? See, it, it's, entertainment. it's very challenging because I tell you what, mainstream media is, 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 is dangling this carrot in front of us. And the carrot is hip hop, be a rapper, and start a record label, you'll make tons of money. So the brothers are getting, they're, 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 getting del they're delusional. They think that that's the right way to go to make money. Well, let me tell you something, you know, rappers, any business that we, we create, 
I always look at this, the business you create has to help our people. It has to be scalable, meaning that you have to create a business that employs people and offers people's benefits. You know what I mean? And that will help our people. The rap industry, the rappers, they don't employ anybody. In fact, they work for the record companies. Do you understand what I mean? They're, they're, they're not scalable, you know? And one of the films I want to recommend, um, and I think I heard Roger Allen Curry talk about this, and I saw it recently. It's a phenomenal film. It's called The Founder. You know how Ray Kroc started McDonald's, or I yeah. stole it from McDonald's Brothers. Phenomenal film. Shows what you can do with passion. But the thing is, we have to look at this in a very strategic perspective, right? And what I say is this. we got to look at what industries are going to be taking off in the next five to uh, ten years. You understand what I'm saying? And then get in and dominate those industries, lock them down, and close them off so no one can get in there and take it from us. We don't think that way. We go by emotions. And a lot of times, we want to be in the limelight. We want attention, you know? And that's what a lot of is about a downfall, you know? So we don't want to be in the background. You, you, you know, let me tell you something. You have these Hollywood stars that go on stage, right? And they talk about how the industry is great. It can make dreams come true. But they are not the power brokers. The power brokers are behind the scenes. They're the studio heads who sit behind the desk and have the power to finance films and green light films. But we don't want to be those people. We want to always be in front of the camera. We want to always be flossing. And that causes the problem. You know, so we need to start looking and thinking more strategically. What what industries or what businesses are going to be taking off in the next five or ten years? They've already done economic projections. They know what these industries are. We know it's you know we know we need to be in STEM programs. We know that that's where things are going. You know, if you're not in technology, you're going to be unemployed. But a lot of us are not. That's very very true. Um, you know, especially with the. Uh how can you say it, this industry where robots are taking over and shit like that. Exactly. See, when you, start, when you start a startup company, it's not just you, you're employing people. You know what I'm saying? When you start a studio, you're employing people. That's what's gonna help our people. It's not by you being, you know, what I call as a unicorn, you, you being a Will Smith. You know, it's, that means that you are kind of like hoarding wealth. You're getting all this money, hmm. Make your films, $20 million a picture. But but where is the factory? Where are the jobs you create? It's not there. Right. You, know, you know, when I looked at Lloyd Kaufman, who was head of Troma Studios, right? I admired that guy because he created a mini studio. And if you went to look at his studio in Hell's Kitchen, he had employees. They were like, he was employing people. They were working every day. And I said, this is what I want to create. You know, this is what we need to be doing, you know? But I, I'm, I'm going to tell you again, it goes back to it is going to be a challenge, okay, because you know, the minute we start putting stuff like that together, you have to be a shrewd businessman because we sometimes, um, you remember MC Hammer talked about he tried to employ all oh, those yeah. people, and turns out when he went broke, they were never around. You have oh, yeah. to be shrewd to make sure you hire the right people. You know, when I, when I, I'm, I'm cutting checks on my production, I'm hiring people, right? And you will come on to my production and you will see that I have a lot of people who are, are diverse, more percentage of white than black, because you know what? I try to hire the most qualified people and I do try to hire people of color, but sometimes if you, if you look at color first, I can bite you in the ass. You know? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Be very careful of that. And I, I just want to understand that we have to go for power positions, you know? That's what we have to start looking for. What is gonna give us power? We have this illusion that because that you, this, are you this thug or you this rapper that you got power, you know? That, that's bullshit. You don't have any power. You're not a captain of industry, you know? And then, and then we look at the people who have power. Look at Steve Wynn, great real estate guy, built hotels in Vegas. That, the guy's a billionaire, yeah. you know what I mean? This is like, these are people with real money and they're employing people, you know? This is how we need as black men to think, you know? But the problem is we don't want to start small. We don't want to work together. We always want to be in front of the camera. We love drama, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, and, and you know what the thing is, we're so hard on each other. When, when another black man gets successful, we say you're selling out, you know? Byron Allen, the guy's a billionaire, right? And he, he was an opportunity to purchase Birth of the Nation from that uh, Nate Parker, right? And Nate Parker didn't sell it to him. I think Nate Parker should have sold it to him, right? Mm -hmm. That's another story. But do you, do you look at what um, 
Byron Allen goes through, called an Oreo a sellout because he's married to a white woman. We don't appreciate what that brother went through to build his empire. You know what I mean? This is not, that was not easy for him, you know? And this is what every, every one of us has to deal with is this empire, you know? The, mm -hmm. the way we treat each other is atrocious. You know, we should be supporting each other. I don't, I don't care, you know, who is he, who is he dating? It's his philosophy that's important. You know what I mean? He, su he supported Birth of a Nation. I didn't, see, I didn't see anybody like Oprah or anybody offering Nate Parker money for that film. Byron Allen did. So that brother should be praised for doing that, not condemned because he's married to a white woman. You know, that's ridiculousness. Mm -hmm. well, let me do this. Um, shout out to Doug. Doug. Let me put let you me on the here. here it's, 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 shout out to Doug. Uh, always is supporting. To O'Shea running the Negro Menace for like a YouTube clan. Uh, let me do this here. Somebody else donated here. Awesome super chat. Let me uh, shout that person out. And if you guys are coming into the chat, you're enjoying a really, 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 really awesome interview. Probably one of the better ones we've had this month. Um, this is a good interview. I'm definitely going to have this guy back because he is on fire. Um, you guys go ahead and like the video for me, okay? Appreciate you who always like the video. My man Rodney Holmes also made a donation of five bucks. Thank you in your super chat. Let me, before we get back to, um, to Ron here, let me talk about uh, working with black men and um, how difficult that can be. First, let me let me let me just share my experience because um, I think what brought Ron uh, the reason why we're having the conversation right now is um, due to this small startup website uh, that was created a few months ago called the Negro And so let me let me, let me talk, talk to you about personally some of the things I have to go through and have had to go through um, to get something like this started. Number one. When you are a black person or a black man, I'm going to come right back to Ron. I just wanted to say this because he's bringing up some good points. When you are a black man and you, um, the first thing that you have to think about is when you want to serve an underserved population, immediately you know that 90% of the time there's a good chance those people are not going to support what you're trying to provide, even though they need it. This is the thing. I'm going to say it again. There's a good chance 90% of the time that that population is not going to appreciate what you're trying to offer, even though they need it. But the second thing you got to think of, if you go that route, like if you're a person and you try to build specifically something for a black audience, once you, you, you cross over to that side, it's very difficult to go back. That means it's very difficult for, let's say, for example, if you're, you're too black, you're too you know, empowering. Um, you can never go in, in, you know, into white mainstream. And let's be honest, white mainstream is where the money is. The white man's ice is colder, okay? Now, if you're talking about um, black women, black community, a little bit more broad, uh, okay, but black men, you know, the thing with black men is that for a site like mine, um, and I'm no Roosh V, right? Roosh V, from what I understand, many of his writers, um, will not write without, you know, the, they will write for this for the fact that it's the Return of Kings and it's free, okay? Me, um, the only way that I can see the writers that I have, um, and it's no, it's no secret, me and Obsidian fell out about this, is that uh, the only way you're pretty much going to be able to get black men with some talent to do something for you is if you pay them. Fair enough, right? Nobody wants anything for free. Um, there was a particular argument, and I said this before, and I'm not trying to start up any trouble, where Obsidian wanted at one point like $100 per article. Now, uh, this is from, you know, and this is not to be you know, mean towards him. He said it was a negotiation. But, you know, at this particular time, he hadn't written for a website for over two years. No published books or anything. Now, a guy like Ron Wills knew I was trying to get it started. He said, give me $33 an article. This is from a person who, writ who wrote um, several books. Right. So, you know, it, it's, it's to the point where, you know, when you see and now Rom and, you know, he asked me, listen, man, I wrote for you for that, that price. Um, can I get more money? Rom is probably now the second highest paid writer on the Negro Manifest. A lot of times when you're trying to set something up for the brothers, you know, 
you will get a lot of hassle, even if you're willing to pay, for somebody overcharging you for maybe something that is out of the league that they wouldn't get somewhere else, you know. And that's the thing. You know, a lot of times when you're dealing with black male writers um, or black male content creators, working with them, there's a ridiculous price associated with them most of the time. Um, you know, and, 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 and usually these people cannot bring a fan base to your website. Uh, they cannot do, I mean, this is what you're dealing with with black men. So it's just to the point where the only way the Negro Manosphere was going to work is I had to put up $10,000. Now, let me tell you another story. There was a situation with a writer. I'm not going to call that person's name. This writer was writing for another website. This particular person sold me four articles that were already published somewhere else. You know, and, you know, after a little bit of strife between me and that particular writer, that person had to rewrite those articles. But, I mean, this person had sold me something that was already on somewhere else. You know what I'm saying? And, and this, this is the kind of problem that you get a lot of times with dealing with black people. And, and when you're dealing with black men in particular, one of the only ways I see that you can work with black men, and I, I, and I do um, recommend this to you, you cannot be a person who is so braggadocious on your accomplishments. That means you cannot be a person who is... Um, uh, 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 so cocky about what you do. That's one thing about black men, right? It's a total turnoff. A lot of times, um, some of the things that I do and I have accomplished, um, I have to downplay certain things uh, just so it doesn't seem that I'm trying to uh, take away from somebody, you know, or, or, or other people. You know, I have to really, really, really try to keep the peace and really uh, try to make what I'm doing very minimal which I don't have any problem doing with that for the brother brothers, but that's the only way it can, it can never work like a Marcus Garvey kind of person. You cannot be a Umar Johnson kind of person dealing with black men. The only way to deal with black men is you have to really make yourself kind of small. I think, um, I'm gonna get back to Ronald. What do you think Ronald, about what I'm saying? It maybe in your experience could be a little different and take yourself off of mute if you can. Good? Yeah, you're good now. You no, know, you're absolutely right. I think that you're 100% spot on because, you know, I think that um, you may not realize that you're bragging or you may, you know, you might realize that the other person is looking at you to NBI, but they're looking at everything you're doing and they're thinking you're uppity and thinking you're all this. And like you said, you know, the people that I've worked, I've worked with uh, brothers a lot and you're right, they've overcharged me to ask for more money than certain other people. I'm like, why are you at, you want so much and you're not giving me that much in return? You know what I mean? It's crazy, you know, the, the way we are. Um, I had one brother wanted me to build a website for him for, for totally free. I said, wow, free? Oh I'm like, Jesus, um, would you ask an, another web developer who's white that same thing? Which, um, no, I don't think you would, you know? So it's a level of respect we have to give each other that we don't give each other, you know? And you, know, I, you and I talk about this, you know, because I used to do a lot of, uh, uh, you know, I used to be a dating coach, I used to work with men, and I found out that a lot of brothers, we, we have a lot of failings. We've not developed into manhood. You know, um, we don't know what it is to be men. We don't know what it is to be really independent, have true agency. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, maybe because we're, we're raised in a home where there wasn't a father or maybe a, we, the father we had wasn't very good mm -hmm. or he wasn't out there, um, you know, working or had his own thing. But we just simply, you know, we're very hard on each other. We don't know how to treat each other. So but I think you're, you're spot on. We definitely do have to downplay that because the times in my life that I've, I've seen that, brothers have come at me is when they, they may see a girl that I'm dating that they like and they get envious or they see that my film got picked up for distribution and I get this big check and they get all upset and you know it's trouble you know yeah it's, it's so much trouble thanks Jerome uh, for uh, the donation and as far as for free um, you know the, the thing is dealing with black men where there's so much potential in this industry, black male media is an untapped industry because nobody wants to, <laughs> let me just say this, nobody wants to deal with you niggas. <laughs> I'm just gonna keep it real. Uh, for the most part, nobody wants to deal with you niggas. Um, and the reason why they don't is for aforementioned reasons that we're talking about right now. Um, what we're doing at the negromanosphere.com um, is probably, the fact that it's been up six months and it's been able to pay black male writers for the most part, for those that are our main writing staff, 
uh, it's unheard of. Now, the, the thing is, uh, you know, you can work with black men, but once again, you're going to have to downplay your own personal account and you're going to have to be okay with staying out of the limelight. Yeah. You, know, you, you, you have to be able, that's why I have this channel. I bring people on like, you know, the, you know, uh, brother Armstrong, you, you just have to know how to share your platform with other brothers. And that's the thing, you know, that a lot of black men don't understand is you don't have to be always in the, you know, like, like Ron, what, Ron, go into more into detail about that because you actually were doing uh, a better job explaining about the limelight and all that stuff. Well, you know, when, you, when you're building a business, you have to understand, like, um, and be realistic about it because it takes time to build a business. You're not going to, and we, we're so much on immediate gratification and immediate return. This is why we gravitate to hip hop and rap and creating a label because we see, oh, we can make a lot of money real quick and then we can floss, right? But to build a real business of substance, it's going to take time, it's going to take work. And you may be behind the scenes a lot, you know? And for a lot of brothers, that's not good. That's not good. You know, they, they, they want to, feel like, oh, you know what, I'm getting all the praise, I'm out there, and they want the ego stroked. So it's very difficult for us to have that kind of, um, that patience, that, that, um, that type of like looking over the course of five years and projecting where our business will be and working toward that objective. It's very difficult for us to do that. But O'Shea, if I can, I want to um, go back to a little bit of what you were saying, because I want to give some, some of the brothers advice. Sure. And, and this is advice if they want to start their own production company or their okay. own film yeah. uh, I'm hoping that this advice will help them you know the first thing I, you know I think that you need to do is to get an accountant and um, so I'm gonna give you a couple of three tips here that are gonna help you get bankrolled in finance and get your films going okay the first thing is get a good accountant I don't care if it's for the H&R block just go get an accountant and they can advise you on a proper structure to form your company you're gonna have to incorporate right and most times with filmmakers you can incorporate and put together an LLC it's really inexpensive get you a good entertainment lawyer that get, get a very inexpensive one um, you can find one by just googling one so the next thing you want to do is you want to open a Chase bank account or you want to open a Bank of America some type of bank account in your corporate name right Right? When you do that, and when you open that bank account in the company name after you've incorporated, you have your LLC, they're going to want to see your papers. You know, the bank, after a while, when you start depositing money in there, um, they're going to extend you a line of credit. And that, that's awesome. If you have a company, they're going to send you a lot of credit. It could be anywhere from five to $10,000. When I started my company, RK Center Creations, I was amazed. I started with Bank of America, and they gave me a $20,000 line of credit. Well, you know what I did with that? I bank, I put that into my film, you know? But don't, they're going to ask you what business you're in. Don't talk a lot about the business because you know film is a risky business, you know? But as um, long as you're keeping some money in the account and um, your personal uh, credit is not really trash, the bank will extend you a line of credit if you have a, a corporation. So that's something you can do right away to get over the capital, start out and produce your first film. Okay, for those who don't want to go that route, say you have a, a script or intellectual property or an idea and you want to pitch it to a studio, that's great too. What you can do is you can write a letter to many of the studios, like I said, Universal um, and Paramount and all that. And basically, you can ask them if they would be willing to read your script. You know, it's an inquiry letter, send it to them. Most of them will say no. How do you get around that? So the way you get around that is you call up or you write to the secretary or the administrative assistant. Those people in those, those companies are wannabe CEOs. And in this industry, it's not uncommon for a person to start out as a secretary in the mailroom and the next month they're running the company. So you want to make friends with the gatekeeper, the secretary, make friends with them, ask them if they would read your screenplay, ask them if you can send it to them. And if they love your screenplay, they will recommend it to the head of development. And you may even get a meeting. You know what I mean? So um, that's a great way to go about it. Let's say you're an actor, right? You're an actor, you don't have an, an agent, you're looking for an agent. Here's a great, what I call a hack to get a good agent. Team up with a filmmaker, right? And, and tell that filmmaker, why don't you put a name actor in your film, right? And it's very easy to get a name actor. I've gotten name actors for like $5,000, you know, $2,000. Just pay them a little bit, but you can, they don't, they'll, they'll dictate how many scenes they can be in. So it'll probably be just one quick scene. They'll call the name actor, right? Um, name actor's agent, and that agent, they'll negotiate with the agent, right? So you tell that filmmaker, can I be on that call with you to negotiate the deal? You can say I'm your partner. You'll get in good with that agent, and the actor then can try and pitch themselves to the agent to get represented. 
that's a way to get through the back door. So those are uh, three techniques that you can use um, to actually break into the industry. Again, the first one is for filmmakers who want to get their, their films financed. And if you want to know if you should start out with a short film or feature film, it's really up to you how much money you have. You know, if you have like 10, 20,000, I would say, try to go for a feature, if not a short film. Um, if you want to sell your screenplay um, to a studio, start out pitching to person in the mailroom, secretary, as an actor, work with a filmmaker, um, and try to get an uh, actor in the film who has a name for themselves and try to work with their agent and uh, to get them to represent you. Because for actors, if you're not represented by a good agent, it's very difficult for you to get real roles. It's all about networking. So I hope that helps um, people out there start, you know. Okay, let me, let me ask you this, because you make uh, some, some really good points, and let me do this, uh, Stephen Jackson. In addition to having some of the best content consistently on YouTube, and having the ability to speak on a variety of different levels, you funny fuck. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, man. Um, let me ask you this because, um, you know, there are a lot, I, I used to go to this place called um, um, Access Cable um, in Sacramento, my buddy. I never really went in it my, my actual self, but I noticed there were a lot of, um, you know, community programs like Access Cable that will help you get into how to edit films, yeah. um, stuff like that. And then there are all these little small, film festivals that were really, really, really on a kind of like an underground level that a lot of people were participating in. Now, how, how powerful are these smaller film festivals um, and stuff like that as to getting your foot into Hollywood? Okay, so this goes back to what I was saying before. When I did the film festival circuit, I actually went to cons and I ran into Spike and his wife. And we sat down and we had lunch together and we talked about it. And I was like, Spike, why is there so few black people here? He goes, oh, that's, that's the way it is all the time. And what I began to realize is I had an actual distaste for the film festivals. I didn't like them. And, and the reason being, I'm going to tell you why. I noticed a consistent pattern, whether it's the black film festivals or like Sundance or, um, you know, Tribeca, which are some of the top tier film festivals. They always seem to have an agenda, of, and that was back to that liberal agenda of the films they awarded and picked. Right? And it was very frustrating because you're told when you go to film school, or if you're a writer, or if you're an actor, that it's all about talent, man. If you have talent, you'll be in a coffee shop, waiting tables, and a famous producer will discover you. That's not so. They're, they're, they're looking for a, uh, people to fit within that agenda. You know what I mean? So that's the thing I would say is the film festival circuit, if you want to get an audience and you want that immediate, um, feedback from a live audience, film festivals are a great way to do that. But it's very difficult to um, get your film into a top tier festival where top producers and agents will be at. It's very difficult to do that. You'll end up going to more of the bottom tier festivals where mm -hmm. it'll just be like a you know, nice audience that will appreciate your film, you may win an award. But in Hollywood, those awards from those lower tier film festivals mean jack, they don't mean anything. It's like your film degree. It doesn't mean anything in Hollywood. It's all about who you're connected with. And let me go back to tell you this, because I, I don't want to burst some bubbles, but some of these people that you see getting these deals, get the deals for a specific reason. And I'm not, I'm not trying to put anybody on blast or, 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 or trying to vilify anybody, but you know, I think you guys know there, there was um, a great uh, web series that I watched, um, and it was kind of popular. It was called um, Awkward Black Girl by Issa Rae, and mm -hmm. I, I think she sold it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yo, know, and it became a series called Insecure, right? But one of the things you have to understand is that when you watch the original series, which I, I loved, I, I followed it, it wasn't that great. You know what I mean? It was like, you're like, well, why did they pick this up? And why are they giving her all these praises and accolades? You know, now she's off doing other deals and all that. And if you watch, if you watch Insecure, you'll see that there's a constant theme, the attack of the black male. Because she's calling black men no good, her boyfriend's no good. She's saying that black women, you know, we shouldn't be selling for less. What does that mean, be selling for less? So you, you know, no other race has their women bashing their men, and 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 right now that's that is the accepted norm um, in the industry is to have these women, our women, as proxies, as and to to basically belittle us and attack us in the media. And I think like, you know, when they give uh, individuals like Issa Rae all these, these, these praises and these deals, you gotta kinda look at it sideways in a way. You gotta say, what's really going on here? Another thing that um, I saw was um, 
Dear White People, right? I think that's what it's mm -hmm. called. I saw it in the theaters. It got picked up for a, a series. And what I saw in there right away was, again, playing out the agenda. You know what I mean? Here you have was a biracial girl confused about her, nat, you know, where she, her, her alliances were. Was it to black nationalism to a white or to her white heritage, right? And along the way, you had a brother who was questioning his sexuality. And then you had all these themes. And it was nothing there that really promoted the idea of a strong black character supporting the black agenda. You know what I mean? And so you see these things that come out and you think that, oh, they got these awards, they got these deals because these people were super talented and that was not so. And even Spike, who I think is an awesome filmmaker, when he did his first film, She's Gotta Have It, I think that one of the reasons why it, it, it was so well received is because it dealt with black female sexuality. You know? <laughs> it explored this, this black woman who was having relationships with multiple men at the same time. You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, I think that 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 was uh, very prime to help him get into the industry. You know what I mean? So what I'm saying, uh, what I'm saying is, you know, it, it's not all about talent. It's about, you know, the, the, the current agenda at the time and, and how you fit into that agenda. If you play into that, then you'll, you'll be given awards and accolades. And I think it goes back to what you're saying. If you are very pro-black and you're looking out for that, well, don't expect uh, mainstream media or Hollywood to welcome you and embrace you, you know? Um, I, I've made Wars of Bitches, I think it's one, a great film, it won a lot of awards, but I think Hollywood shunned it because it had an interracial relationship between a black, um, black man and a, and a white woman, she's a white soldier. And it was a small part of the film, but I think that was enough for Hollywood to say, oh, no thank you. Meanwhile, you got Scandal out there, and right. it was crazy <laughs> Scandal, and no problem with that, you know? So, you know, you got Holly Berry, and was that Monster's Ball, and she's doing this crazy sex scene, and um, with this white guy, what's his name? Um, who's, who is, uh, I forgot his name, but. Hollywood loved that. And well, she got nominated for an Oscar or something with that. You know, I'm like, wow, that's interesting, you know? And meanwhile, going back to the emasculation of black male image, if you look at every film that comes out from Red Tails, uh, which is the story of Tuskegee Airmen from Hancock, um, you see that every time there's this theme of black men hooking up with a white woman or a black man who's comfortable with sexuality and sleeping with a lot of women, the film is um, it's put down by white males and also black females. They, they attack it, they attack it because they don't want, they're not comfortable with this. Now, you know, Idris Elba is one of the greatest actors we have today, right? And there was a lot of talk on social media about him playing James Bond, 007, which would be an awesome role for him. I think that would just, it's, it's a perfect fit. But you have to understand, that James Bond is like the Captain Kirk syndrome. James Bond sleeps with every type of woman of all color, all nationality. I don't think they're gonna be comfortable with a black man doing that. You know what I mean? So this is why I'm thinking, I don't know if we're ever gonna see him in that role of James Bond. You know? <laughs> Though I would love to, it'd be the coolest role ever, but I don't think we're gonna see that. You know? So for, for black actors, I'm just saying that that's some of the challenges you're gonna face in terms of your, your masculinity and your sexuality is that Hollywood's not gonna be keen on that. And another thing that we see, which is a common theme, and even in corporate America, but I've experienced this personally, is that the more of a non-threat you are, the easier it is for you to gain access to certain resources. You know, being of light skin complexion, I've noticed that I've had a little bit easier of a time, not much, but a little easier of a time. And if, if you're a, a, a very passive and timid um, black man, then the industry is kind of a little more open to you. But if you're dark skinned, if you're projecting your voice, if you're confident, you're gonna say, oh, you're angry, you're a threat, you know? And then they start to filter you out, you know what I mean? So that's some of the things we have to be aware of. Let, let me well, talk let me to you. Oh, let me, oh, let me, let me real check okay. Okay. Not going, not going. Uh, okay, so you're definitely an intelligent person. Um, so I'm not gonna, uh, what I'm gonna say is gonna be an assuming gesture. Um, and I'm only saying this to prove a point. Uh, you strike me as a brother who um, is open to the world. I'm pretty sure you've traveled you know, many different places, met different people, okay? Um, and I, I wanna just use you as an example. You seem to me as uh, somebody who maybe would date a plethora of different races of women than just black women. 
Okay. So with that being said, now somebody like Nate Parker or um, a black person who wants to talk about the black experience uh, but is not married to a black woman. Now, me personally, um, I'm kind of in between. I kind of understand both sides of the story. Um, a lot of times it's very difficult for a person, a black man in particular, who wants to get into the movie industry, but he's talking about, well, the system is racist. The system is this, system is that. But this person is married to a white person, white woman. Um, for example, uh, you know, Nate Parker had a white woman who um, had a rape charge on him, no problem. Uh, then he, you know, still ended up marrying a white woman, but at the same time uh, wanted to uh, kind of talk about the black experience and uh, put push his movie uh, on the behalf of a strong black male. Now, before we get into your response to this, you talked about there are rules to the industry that you must follow um, in order for one to move up in the industry. Now, likewise, and I could be wrong, but there's definitely rules to follow amongst black people, amongst the black community. Uh, one of those rules that is unspoken and unheard is if you are a black man uh, and you decide that you want to marry a white woman, cool. You better not fucking have anything to say about the black experience. You better not talk about racism. And you better not talk about how black people need to come together and how black people need to empower one another with a black woman. Now, here's the thing. I'll be honest to say this part of your response. The Negro Manosphere, the website, um, and I think one of the reasons why I probably get as much support as I do is for the fact that the woman that I'm with, the people see her on the videos, is a black woman that's African American. Now, I, as, as much as brothers hate, love to hear me give black women a good ass whooping on the video, a lot of brothers really appreciate that. Okay, he has a black woman, she's from, you know, they're living in Poland together. Okay, I got a lot of support. And in fact, I think that really kind of stopped a lot of the haters in the black female arena from, you know, if I had a white girl here, it would be, it would be different, you know? But what's your response to that? I, I, I mean, I want to hear what, what you have to say um, about the, the talented brothers that we do have who are dating interracially but want to still talk about the black experience and want to be a part of the community. But you're still on mute. You're on mute. Okay. I totally understand that, you know, and, you know, I can't, I can't say that they're wrong. But at the same time, I think, it, again, it goes back to are you just looking at the surface of things? Because can you name for me um, a black man who's married to a black woman that produced a film like Birth of a Nation? No. You know, he, he, you know I don't see that, that his wife, who was white, was stopping him from doing that. In fact, um, I see that she supported him in, in, along the way in making that film come to fruition. You know what I mean? So I think too many times, O'Shea, we look at color and, and, and you know, this comes from our experience here in North America as, as slaves. You know, we, there, there's such, you know, this issue within us in, in our own race is so complex. And um, it's very difficult for us to, to, to grasp the idea that you could be light skinned, you can be biracial, but you could still be down for the cause. That's, that's kind of like, we can't accept that. It's weird. And we can't accept the fact that, well, he or she may be married to a white person, but they're still down for the cause. You know, it's very difficult for us to accept that. But mm -hmm. I think the reality is, you know, there's a lot of people that I've met in the industry who are white, who, were, who had my back. Yeah. You know? And if I had just looked at them from a color perspective, I wouldn't be where I, you know, I, I would not be where I am, you know? And if I, if I full heartedly, um, with, with just my people. I was a member many, many years ago of, of trying to support, you know, organizations that were black organizations. And one by one, I saw them fall apart and, and implode. And I got out of it. I said, it's not going to happen. If we just look at the conscious community, look at them, you know, all these brothers who are so-called so conscious, comedic science and all this, what's going on with them now? They're fighting each other, man. But if I look and say, oh, they're dark brothers who are down for the cause, but they're, they're at each other's throats, you know? So I'm saying, you know, I, I, I think we just have to stop looking at the surface of things and start to look a little bit deeper and, and say, 
what is that brother's ideology? What, what does he stand for? What is, what is his work saying? And let's look at that, you know, because we're so quick to, to, to call each other uh, coons and buffoons. It's ridiculous, man. It's ridiculous, you know? And I think also, um, just um, I want to broach um, the subject real quick, is that I think, you know, let me put it to you this way. The mainstream media sets the narrative. And black people are very, we're very influential. We, we, we um, well, I just say this, we're very influenced by mainstream media, mm -hmm. you know. And if you understand how Hollywood is set up, Hollywood, um, the culture, the climate, the stories that Hollywood produces, the movies are dictated by major think tank institutions like Tavistock, the Heritage Foundation. Um, and these foundations work in conjunction with, you know, the CIA. And what they do is they define culture they work through social engineering so the narrative is defined by uh, mainstream media we're socially conditioned to think about certain things so uh, what am i trying to say i'm saying this we are focused on an issue that's a non-issue when we look at interracial dating which represents less than um black men with white women represents less than six percent of you know six percent with the majority of black men marrying black women. Mm -hmm. Why are we so focused on that small demographic? It's actually less than 6% if you just count black men and white women, um, not counting like Asian or married to Asian or Latino. So um, that's really a non-issue and they're, they're making it seem, and this is mainstream media, like it's a social epidemic that's happening in our communities. And it's not, it's actually not. And one of the things that I address in my film, um, White Power, which is a comedy, which is that we have to look at um, the abortion rates that have that are just out of freaking control. It's, it's on the point of genocide. You know what I mean? When we look at at one point, and I think it was New York, that the um, the, the 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 birth the abortion rate was higher than the, the birth rate for for black babies. That's a real issue that we're not focused on and we're not talking about. But yet we're so focused on everything else that is not going to, to, to matter in the long run. And we're not focused on the more important things that'll, that'll um, have us here in the next century and, 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 and in the future. We got to start looking at things like that, you know, and stop majoring in the minors. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Majoring in the minors. Uh, let, let, me, let me do this. Let me do this real quick because I'm, I'm thinking about. Um, what to ask here in this particular uh, statement. Now, let, let's get back to um, this interracial thing. Um, Six percent, I know most black men marry black. Well, I think that, you know, um, blackdemographics.com says like six percent of black women marry uh, non-black men, but like something like 15 percent of black men marry non-black women. I think that the problem is this. The brothers who do marry out, outside of their race, I, I don't have any statistics to prove this, but I'm just going to give a hypothesis. I think those brothers are more enterprising. Um, they have traveled more. Um, they are more extensive in their knowledge. They're probably more than likely to have a higher IQ. I'm talking about though that higher percentage. And, and these type of black men you see doing very well, whether it's medicine, whether it's in um, film or something like that. I, I think that what ends up happening is the reason why people pay such attention to it is because these are the brothers that end up being shunned and kind of being forced out of the community. And then those brothers, uh, for whatever reason, because I don't think anybody grows up saying, you know, I'm really not attracted to black women at all. I think that just kind of happens over time with, with uh, uh, the previous bad experiences, when you, you know, your child, and then um, you, know, you go to college and you see things and you, you get introduced to stuff like hiking or traveling or whatever it is. And you, you, you get new friends and get new life. And then you break into industry. You're very talented like Nate Parker. Um, and then you're judged because you actually are an enterprising black person. Um, and the black men that I do see that date outside of the race are merry outside of the race for the most part. And now don't quote me, but these are the brothers who are more enterprising. You know, they're more the top or top of the barrel. They make more money. They have more intelligence. Um, so when when these guys are 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 like, hey, you know, you're kind of selling out. Well, these guys have made a platform for themselves, and, and a lot of people are jealous because they didn't bring that platform to a black woman. But I think the reasons why people look at those because those are high performing black men, in my opinion. What's your opinion on that? 
So, you know, a lot of people ask me, like, why are there a high percentage of black men with white women in the, in the industry, in the entertainment industry, right? And, and, and they always say, well, they're color struck. You know, I think Dr. Umar Johnson said something I thought was very insulting. He said they had a psychological dysfunction, you know? And I'm like, wow, <laughs> that's a very, like, derogatory thing to say, you know? Um, but it goes back to this. Margaret Sanger, and I, I dealt with her in my um, film, White Power, um, introduced feminism into the black community, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of black women, not all, um, welcomed it, and they're, they're still operating based on that principle, right? And what you'll find, number one, in the I'm only speaking about the film industry, the entertainment industry, is that they're, they're – as a black man, you're going to be in the circles of more white people and white women than you will with black women, right? So there's there's more the numbers are going to be more in favor of you hooking up in the interracial relationship. But not only that, and I think the most important part is, you know, there's no secret that in that community some may call it a matriarchy, right? You have you have a lot of black women, again, not all, who will not accept a black man in power. In fact, they go out of their way to sabotage black men who try to achieve some level of success. I recently heard the term educated lane. I'm like, why would sisters refer to somebody as an educated lane? Mm -hmm. And do you know the first time I was called monkey? It wasn't by a white woman, it was by a black woman. And I was really? shocked. Yeah, I was totally shocked, you know? So, <laughs> and I, I was like, whoa, you know? Uh, so, but you know, didn't matter to me, you know, I don't go around hating black women. No, they're, they're the original women, you know, the, the model that, you know, all of the women were molded after. But the thing that we have to keep in mind is that white women come from a patriarchal society. They understand what it is to have a man as a, as a leader and to build a business. They understand their, their role in terms of supporting that man mm -hmm. and being in his corner. Unfortunately, because of people like, you know, Margaret Singer, Gloria Steinem, um, who were very int instrumental in destroying the unity between black men and black women, black women are now vying for power from black men. So it's very difficult for a man, like you say, who's enterprising, who wants to build his empire, to work with a black woman who's there, who thinks that she, um, you know, is the man. <laughs> you know, that she should be um, in the limelight, leading, you know? And there can't be two leaders. They can't, you know... Put simply, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fault the brothers for this, brothers have to be more enterprising. We have to build businesses. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And the people I think that I have had the most difficulty on my productions have been black women. You know, um, I've had situations where black women reported me to the union. I've had situations where they tried to um, do a coup d'etat on my set. You know? Oh, 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 are you serious? Uh, like, yeah. an, like an African military coup on your... <laughs> I'm not saying that there weren't white people that tried to do that. They were, you know. I think that, you know, a lot of white males have a problem taking orders from a black director. You know, they, they're like, what, what, what? But what I'm saying is that, I'm saying is it, it's that you have a situation of social engineering to where some black women have drank the Kool-Aid. Mm -hmm. So what they're going to do is battle black men for power, position, and, if, and, and a lot of black women are seeking out black men who are passive, who don't want to take charge, you know? So when you have a brother who comes along who you say wants to build his business, who wants to, to make his career work, he wants a partner that there is not going to be any drama with, you know? And a lot of times, because of the ratio in the industry, there's going to be more white women than black women, and he's going to hook up with a white woman, and then especially from the fact that she's from a patriarchal culture, which supports that, she's going to support this brother in his efforts. You know what I mean? So, you know, but that's not to, you know, again, I'm not saying all black women are like that, you know. I'm saying some are, you know. But what I'm saying is we just have to put everything in perspective and understand what's going on, you know, mm -hmm. and, and stop this attack. Obviously, I think the best thing that there could be is that, you know, black men should be with black women, but that's not going to always be the case. And you should never be picking your partner just because she's a black woman or a black man. You know what I mean? Because that can get you in a lot of trouble. You know, mm -hmm. um, you have to understand their, their, their character, their content. What are they for? You know, and, and too many of us, especially in um, 
the conscious community and black nationalism, we just think too superficial. We're looking at the surface and we tend to discount people because they're biracial, they're with a white person and so and so. Like I don't, you know, if, uh, if a black woman, she's with a white guy, I don't, that doesn't really bother me. I don't think it bothers most black men, you know? <laughs> right, right, it doesn't. So my thing is like, what is she doing to help us in our cause or to, to, to further the, the progression of our people or, or, or justice, you know? Um, that's what we have to be looking at ultimately. Quickly labeling somebody just because of their lighter skin, they're biracial, they're with a white person, you know, that's problematic the way I see it. Let me, let me, let me do this. Um, give a shout out to Crystal. Uh, for her super chat donation, she always Crystal was fucking rich because like every damn day, Crystal must be the president of Nigeria, so she got all kind of money. Thank you, Crystal, for what you do in as far as here in the super chats and stuff like that. Um, all of you appreciate you um, for what you guys are doing. Um, you know, I really, 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 really appreciate everybody um, that help out here at the uh, Ocean Blogcast channel. Let me uh, ask, ask our, our, our guest one last question. Um, if I can, because it's three in the fucking morning here. So um, let me let me let me ask you this, because um, time. Uh, so you know, and, and, you know. Also, you're a, you're a writer, okay? You're you're an excellent writer. I just want to ask your opinion because you you, you did um, ask to, to write a, a smoking article in the NegroManosphere.com. Let's talk about the development of black male media um, and what little websites like the NegroManosphere.com. Um, you know, you, you talk about starting off small. Give us some advice here that we would know from your, your perspective. What it is that we can do, you as a writer and a filmmaker, um, what can black men who want to start, you know, things like blogs, um, you know, get into that type of media also? Um, how should we go about it? How should we start it? And, and uh, what way should we do it? Oh, make sure you take yourself off mute. I think that we first have to start looking at talent, you know, and, and going out there and get the most talented people um, and start working with them. And they're excellent sources like Upwork.com. I love like, it. Yeah, you can go you get freelancers, you can get people from India, from very cheap, Nigeria, very cheap to work with you. You don't have to have a lot of capital, as I said before. But I think that let's create that platform and um, whether it be a blog, whether it be a streaming website where you can put your movies on there, but the most important thing is let's try to work together because the only way this is going to work is we pull together talent. And, and, and like what I did with you, O'Shea, I said, listen, I'll write for you. I don't care about the money. I want to see the Negro the Manosphere take off. You know, it's not about like, oh, how much am I getting in return? You know, I have my source of income. You know, I'm not worried about that. You know, and I think that more of us have to look at that. You know, obviously, I do think that if you're talented, you should be paid for, for your services. But what's important is that we have to we have to see where something can go and see the dream and see what it could be and support that. You know how many opportunities I lost? You know, um, I don't know if you know James Gunn, um, who did Guardians of the Galaxy. Him and I were great friends when we were doing my film um, Bugged. He would come and he would give me all this music from these rock musicians to put in my film. He wrote about me in a book he was writing. And he said, Ron, I'm going to go to Hollywood and I'm going to get an apartment. I'm going to start out. He says, do you want to come? I'm like, yeah, nah. But see, that's the thing. And I, I missed out on a great opportunity there. You know, so I'm saying to you, it's like we've got to band together and, and black people have a hard time seeing the potential in something. We don't see potential. We always want to know, all right, what you got going on? How big is it? How large are you living? You know what I mean? And then we want to jump aboard. But we, we don't want to come aboard during its inception. And I think the Negro Manosphere is at a pivotal point right now to where it could take off, man. But we, and, and, and to your, your viewers right now, I say to you, look, don't just be a watcher. You know, ask O'Shea, what can you do to help, you know, help it? You know, what can you do to contribute to it to make it bigger than what it is? You know, and that's how we start. I, I totally agree. I totally agree. You know, um, what I can say is, uh, just to piggyback off of what you're seeing, is, you know, black male content creation is a demand for it. Um, people don't have a lot of respect for black men, but black men are starting to understand that, you know, hey, we don't have a dog in the fight. 
then the only way to get a dog in the fight is to, you know, read these articles, watch these videos, um, you know, support how you can, you know, if you're not able to do it financially, but just, you know, watching the video, sharing, telling somebody about it, and then reading the articles. I think that we are at a pivotal position, um, you know, with black male media. And, and the thing that, that I want to sh share with you, brothers, that I think is the key in starting your own um, blog, don't be afraid to pay people. Um, and that's something that you got to understand. You, you told me this uh, the other day. Don't try to do everything by yourself. Yeah, I believe you told me that, right? Yeah, I did, yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, in in the, in the the thing was in, in that particular instant he was uh kind of he was, it's still good to hear things even though you know it, what it is but he's preaching to the choir of that position because you know I for example um you cannot do everything at the same time it's impossible a lot of brothers want to get into business and have their own YouTube channel you want to have your own blog and you want to do your own radio shows. Uh, it's just impossible to do all of those things at the highest efficiency. You may be a great YouTube creator, but you may be a shitty article writer. Yeah. You may be a great article writer, but you're a terrible YouTube presenter. Very few people are both. You may be a very good article writer, a very good video presenter, but you suck at business. You know, you're never, you never can be all three. What I'm, why is this important, brothers? Because uh, the reason is, you need to um, allocate whatever resources you have to people who know how to do those things. For example, I am an okay writer. It's pretty, pretty funny when I write, but I'm not an author or a writer. But I will post blogs every now and then if I feel like it. Okay, Alan Roger Curry is a great writer. Ronald K. Armstrong is a great writer. Ron Wills is a great writer. Obsidian is a great writer. I, am, I do not like writing so prolifically. But with the money that I do make, I'm not afraid to pay people to put out certain kind of content that's going to be at a certain value. That's the thing that I see with black men with business. Business, sometimes you got to understand that you're not going to make a dime for maybe a year, maybe two years. That's how business works. You know, I think a lot of people don't understand that. What's up to Nibby? Um, and, and like I said, when I started the Negro Ministry.com, I went in, went in understanding and accepting the fact that this may never make a fucking dollar in the first year. I was totally okay with that. The reason why I was okay with that, I started my YouTube channel, didn't make one dollar in 19 months. I just wake the hell up. He was the guy that told me to put my AdSense uh, when I had only 500 subscribers. Hey, put your ads on. On my other channel that has 38,000. You guys gotta understand, when you start something like that, there is no fucking quick roads to this shit. You know? You need people around you that have credibility. You know, like Alan Roger Curry has a lot of credibility in writing. And so when he started writing for me, it made the website credible because, oh, shit, Alan Roger Curry is writing at the Negro Manosphere. Let's check out the Negro Manosphere. Uh, Ronald K. Armstrong is making a film. He has credibility in something. I work with him. I have credibility. This is what you guys got to understand. You, you cannot try to get into certain fields like blog writing or article writing or places like this uh, for the most part with very little credibility. It's very difficult. You may be a great YouTuber, but you know nothing about article writing. You know nothing about movies. You need to work with people who are in those respected fields that know that. And it costs money to do that. You know, I think that if you brothers understand that, then you can be more effective. You know, you just can't expect that you're going to do everything. You're going to get in. You're going to be podcasting. You're going to get into doing short films. You're going to be YouTubing. You cannot do all of that shit yourself. I mean, that's just my, you know my my take on it. Uh, I, any, any any kind of last words on 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 that or anything I else? I totally agree with that. And just from the you know my film perspective, you know, with all my films that I've ever produced, I me and my producer we cut check. And we, I've worked with three award-winning cinematographers. I've hired well-known actors because I want the quality of my work, and more importantly, I want to pay pay my people. You know, and when you do that, they respect you more, and you get a higher quality of work. You know, so just um, and, and just in conclusion, what I want to say about breaking into the industry and working in Hollywood, I know I've said a lot of things about you know the agenda and what's what 
you know, Hollywood's trying to do with the black male image. You know, but what I, what I want you, bottom line, to think about is I want you to be a warrior. I want you to go in there with the idea, I'm going to go in there, I'm going to conquer this, and I'm going to build something of my own. Um, I don't want you to go in there with the mentality of, I just, you know, want to work, need a paycheck. No, go in there and crush it, you know, dominate it and build something to where you don't have to go back to them for financing, don't have to go back to them for a job. You know, I have my own startup, I produce my films, I consult major companies and ad agencies, so I'm in demand, right? And the way that you get there is not by just saying I'm satisfied with a check. You know what I mean? So just keep in mind that black man, you're the original man. Black woman, you're the original woman. And, and respect yourself, respect one another. And go in Hollywood with the idea of, hey, I'm going to be making this a better place for my people who are going to come after me. And so that we will have to experience the same problems. Oh, shame. it's a shame that we're still going through racism. We had Malcolm. We had Marcus Garvey. Why are we still going through these same issues? These brothers should have taken care of this, you know? So um, that's all. Let's just once and for all get in there, kick butt, and just put it into this racism thing, man. We've been dealing with this too long. Once again, and I definitely agree. Thank you, Biopi. He's a great moderator for us, uh, ABL channel. O'Shea, keep bringing the brothers together and inspiring us, bro. That's what it's all about, man. You know, guys like Ronald K. Armstrong, he has a plethora of information I don't have. Hopefully, when I get back from Africa, I can have him come back. Um, you know, we can basically, you, you know, do this again. Uh, once again, thank you, brother. Uh, I actually wanted to do this interview. I stayed up at one till one in the morning here yes, in sir. Poland uh, to make sure that we can complete this. Thank you. I appreciate that. No, 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 no problem. And I mean, I mean, I always say this um, in, in doing business with um, your brothers um, or whoever else, brothers. One thing I want to advise, and uh, I don't have as much experience in business as Ronald does because I'm just doing this on a small scale. Um, but what I can say is listen to people um, and always follow through on what you say that you're going to do. Uh, it's very important. Uh, like, for example, with the NegroManosphere.com. Um, even though it's a small website, um, I make sure that it's new content every day. And even Ron was telling me, make sure that, you know, if you want to grow, be consistent, new content every day. And even a YouTuber, you know, you know, uh, YouTubing, I put out a lot of fucking content. Uh, I do it. I put a lot of videos almost every day, sometimes more than two or three times in the day. And the reason why I do that is to stay consistent. You know what I mean? It's very hard to stay competitive. You know, there are other YouTubers who are maybe better than me, other YouTubers who have more opportunity than me, but I swing the bat much more often than anybody in black YouTube. I put out way more content than anybody in black YouTube. And because uh, I'm able to do that, I'm able to get, you know, um, you know more interviews in. Um, I'm able to bring a different experience with people. And, and what you guys should also understand is um, keep your appointments. You know, yeah, in day you can email me. Keep your appointments, brothers. Uh, if you have an appointment that you have and a show that you need to do with somebody, keep it. You know, don't cancel your appointments. Keep your shows. You know, if you have an interview, you have a collaboration, don't flake. Be on time. Be there. Be ready to work. You know, be ready to take it serious. Um, and once again, thank you guys uh, for Enday98. My email is there. Appreciate you. Thank you, Ron, for coming on, man. Hopefully, I can have you come back when I uh, come back from Africa on my main channel. That's going to be a smoker because I have a lot of subscribers on there that would love to hear what you have to say. And um, I mean, thank you, man. Appreciate you and uh, come back again. Okay. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Appreciate you, man.